Welcome back, everybody, to the Philosophy of Art and Science podcast. In the front, we're going to be saying this from now on. If you want to support, make sure you go to patreon.com slash tawahado. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash T-E-W-A-H-I-D-O. And you'll see all the lovely reasons why. Today, our special guest with us is Deacon Scott. And right now he's in the Midwest, but he is a Los Angelino like myself. Welcome to the program. Thank you, sir. Glad to be here. And Glad by the to way, be with you. By the way, my Coptic friends call me Deacon Beshoy. My American friends call me Scott. My Ethiopian friends call me Deacon Sirak. Oh, Deacon Sirak. <laughs> yes, like the wisdom of, of Sirak That's from right. the yeah. Dedero canon. Yeah, for sure. Do you have a preference <laughs> between the three? Oh, man, just depends on who you are, I guess. You know, I've, I've bounced around from cultures for the last 40 years. <laughs> well, I'll give you a digital uh, kiss of peace because I know the Coptic <laughs> tradition a little bit. But then because I am of the good is right, I will, I'll, I'll, I'll say Deacon Sirak. I'll say Diakon sure. Sirak. Diakon for sure. Sirak. <laughs> for sure. No problem, my brother. <laughs> All right. So it's uh, I did this program recently with my brother Minilik, who's – associated with the Holy Trinity Cathedral, one of the first churches of the good is right in the United States mm -hmm. early on in mm -hmm. New York City. Sure. And Holy one Trinity of the one, in the Bronx? That's right, in the Bronx. That's right. And I, he's, spent, he's, I spent he's some time there. there. Oh, okay, okay. So yeah. so you know some of the yeah. same people. And he so his know. family's been there. He, he's yeah. he's second generation. So his his parents have been part of that community for a while. You know, his family is from Jamaica, mm -hmm. but he is uh, born and raised out here. And so he is actually a cradle Orthodox with his mm -hmm. parents being converts. But okay, uh, he, he put us on a little bit to the communities in Jamaica and Trinidad to New York. But through some of the same patronage of uh, his beatitude, Abu Isaac, we, we kind of talked about a little bit the Tekla Haimanot parish, which my parish ultimately be, uh, became, which are the Mary that eventually became two Mary churches. And in enough times now in LA is, is four Mary churches, which, you know, deserves its own episode and is some craziness. But you, you commented on that thread that you were a part of that original community. So I wanted to, to get to know that and learn the history of, of LA a little sure. bit. So can you tell us how you in, got involved with the, the Orthodox Church? I assume you're not cradle, okay. but I am ready to be proven wrong. Well, not quite. Um, I was became Orthodox when I was about 14. 14 oh, that's very ago. young. That's very straight young. Out of, straight out of the crypts into Orthodoxy. Okay, that's a story I got to hear. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, you, you can't really start with the original church that started in uh, late 1979, uh, 1980, without mentioning uh, Anthony Hamilton. Okay, Anthony Hamilton was a, a founding member of the Watch Prophets. And he later became Father Amdision. Okay. So he was a poet, and actually he's still in the Los Angeles area. I was uh, just going to say my friend Orlando, who's from the mm -hmm. Long Beach area, he's told right. me about the Watts Prophets before, and he's told me about uh, and, I've never met yes, him, yes, but he says yeah. there's a, a mural. He says there's a mural of him uh, yes. on the Blue Line, I believe. Yes, yes. He, so, so, so back in the uh, 70s, he was uh, very active in the community. Uh, working with gang members and trying to get people uh, off alcoholism and drugs and things like that. And uh, we crossed paths. And of course, I was very interested in just what he knew. First of all, I was very interested in, po in poetry and he was kind of the master to us. Um, so, you know, it, I, I guess it all started rather innocuously when he invited us over his house and he had all these pictures on the wall of Haile Selassie, of, of the Madonna, of of pictures of you know rastafarians and things like that and i became very intrigued and, and so we asked him i said you know what was this picture up here and he said well that picture is a picture of abuna theophilus you know and he was the he was he, he's a patriarch of the ethiopian orthodox church and of course i was just you know 
coming out of kind of the gang situation and really trying to get in the church because, you know, I just kind of got tired of, you know, running from the police, being chased by other gang members and being shot at, you know, every night. <laughs> and so I was kind of searching, right? So it was just a time in my life when I was really just ready to make a change. And so I asked uh, Anthony, uh, Mr. Hamilton, um, I want to find out more about that. You know, the, 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 the black Madonna on the wall, um, you know, the picture of Haile Selassie, Abuna Theophilus and things like that. Just little things that kind of intrigued us and, and it made us ask questions. And by the way, it was a it was it was three of us. It was brother. I was just going to ask how many of y'all. Uh, yes. To yes. Come so over. it was me and it was another brother named Tony Lampkins and another brother named Tony Robinson. And we were all there together and asking them questions about, you know, what are these pictures and things like that? And he says, well, you know, this is the patriarch of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. And he started explaining to us the history of the church. And we immediately became intrigued. Right. And so we said, well, take us to the church. We want to find <laughs> out about that. And at that time, there was no church anywhere in Los Angeles. Oh, oh, about what time is this? This, this is 79, you said? 78, 79. Mm -hmm. Right. There was nothing here. And um, he actually knew at the time Abba Manderful. Yes. Who later became a Buni mm -hmm. And um, so, but, but he was gone. He was either in New York or in Ethiopia. Okay. We later found out you know, why he was gone and what he was doing. However, he took us to the Coptic church instead, just to Saint give Mark? a taste of uh, St. Mark's Coptic church. Correct. It's still there on Pico and Robertson. Absolutely. Absolutely. And wow, man, let me tell you something. As soon as I walked in that church, I became intrigued. As really? soon as I walked in that church, I felt like, yeah, I'm home. This is it, you know. And out from the veil, this little sleight of bill gentleman steps out and he says hello to us. He could barely speak a word of English. It was all Arabic. And of course, me and my brothers looked at him and, you know, we're coming to the Egyptian Orthodox Church, actually, because and so we're not really up on you know, what this is. So we expected the black man to walk out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> these, are, right. these are some lighter skinned uh, black men. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so he walks out and he says, how are you doing? Right. And, and I, you know, I, I tell you what, my friends were so upfront with him. They looked at him and they said, you're not black. Just right out. Those are the first words we said to him. <laughs> he looked at us very sternly and says, I am black, right? He's pointing to his skin. He says, I'm African, <laughs> right? So right away, he endeared himself to us, right? Um, and then he'd start telling us about the church. You know, he took us for a tour. We saw the icons, the altar, and things like that. And, uh, you know, to our surprise, he says to us, would you like to learn more about the church? And obviously, we said, well, yeah, of course, right? And so he offered to start teaching us Bible study uh, every Tuesday or Thursday, we would drive up to uh, from we would drive from uh, right on the outskirts of Inglewood to Hollywood. I'm sorry, to uh, Robinson Boulevard mm -hmm. in Beverly Hills yeah. and have Bible study with him. He lived in the upper room in the church at an apartment up there. And I never forget this, though. We pretty much got tired of fighting the traffic going back and forth. I was going to say, that's a trek. Yes. And he says, I'll come to you. Right. And he says, eh, you're not coming down to the hood, are you? It's just Bible <laughs> study. Right. <laughs> right. So sure enough, he did. And he used to come once a month. And during the other days, we came to him. I never forget one time we, we asked him, he came to see us. He says, Abuna, aren't you kind of nervous coming down here to the hood? He looked around and says, of course not. They have rougher neighborhoods in Egypt. <laughs> <laughs> I said, wow. He, you know, he's, he's right. That's the like, Church of the Martyrs. Was, yes, yes. And I was like thoroughly impressed. After about, I'd say, four to six months, we decided to get baptized. And um, he baptized all four of us. I actually yeah, including was, was Anthony boy. Hamilton at the time, or yeah, he was already baptized. Oh, okay, he had been baptized by Albert Manderfo years earlier, right? Uh, and so we started to serve with him, okay. And it was very difficult because uh, 
Abuna didn't speak a word of English. Yeah. All he spoke was Arabic and Coptic. Yeah. But Yara would, Yes. <laughs> but but I will never forget my experience with him. Um, he would come to the altar without a book and recite three and a half hours worth of prayer by memory. Wow. Uh, an extraordinarily spiritual man, very gentle, hilarious. Um, and that kind of began my journey with orthodoxy. And it wasn't too long, I'd say about 78. We, we were baptized in, in 19, in the spring of 76. And we attended the church for about two, maybe three years. And all of a sudden, he was abruptly called back to Egypt for some unknown reason. Mm -hmm. And he left us in the hands of his assistant priest, Abuna Bushoi, who was not really the equal to Abuna Lua. And so eventually, we just like, you know, I'm not going back there anymore. It's like all Arabs and Arabic, and I feel like a stranger there. You know, Abuna yeah. Lua kind of gave us preferential treatment. You know, did you pick up the Arabic and Coptic yeah, over yeah, the two, three sure. years? Um, sure, I did. Yeah, um, we, we we actually did a little bit. We picked up more Coptic than Arabic mm -hmm. because that's what all the hymns and things were were sung in. Yeah. And um, yeah, and so he left and come to find out that the uh, leader of Egypt, then Anwar Sadat, had put a warrant out for his arrest. Wow. And as soon as he went back, he got put in jail Man. and he stayed in jail for about eight months to a year before he was released. So during this time, we were kind of lost out there. Right. And so we said, hey, we're baptized. We want to go to church. What shall we do? So Anthony Hamilton decided to contact Abuna Yesak, mm -hmm. who, by the way, had just become an archbishop. OK. Before that, uh, was he just a monk or just a regular bishop? Uh, Abba Manderfo at then then was uh, commissioned, right? He's the he's probably the first and only Ethiopian priest in general, who the emperor then in 1959 commissioned him to come to America and spread the Ethiopian Orthodox Church to the Western-born Africans, which included those in the West Indies those in Central and South North America. That yeah. was his mission. It was his sole mission to do. And from, and so, so he arrived in the late sixties and he began his work. Obviously he went to the Rastafarians first yeah. because Haile Selassie was aware that these guys worship me as gods, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, I think I better send the priest there to straighten them out. Yeah. <laughs> Let work them on know the I'm not God. Yeah. <laughs> Let them know I'm not God. You know, he, he was very unsuccessful, by the way, uh, <laughs> in, 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 in some regards, right? Yeah. But, but uh, uh, Abba Manderfo at the time managed to do a, a great work uh, baptizing over 7,000 people, you know, in, in, in 10 years. Okay. Amazing. And um, uh, after he was ordained Archbishop, he came to uh, Los Angeles with the invitation of uh, uh, Father uh, uh, Anthony Hamilton. And we greeted him. We had a big celebration. It was probably about, I don't know, 80 to 100 of us, all African-Americans. And we had a big celebration for him. And he just sat down and told us, hey, let's start a church. And we were all willing. He says, let's start a church, Abuna. And his so, English is better? Uh, Abba Manderfo? Abba Manderfo's English is perfect. If you ever heard him read Kadassi, he sounds like an auctioneer. You know how those guys, <laughs> you know how, how fast they talk? Yes. Yeah. You just kind I, of follow them. Get, oh, yes. I've been to a police auctions before where they sell the cars. <laughs> yes. Well, his English was impeccable. He's quite intelligent. Uh, Alba Manifold has a master. He had a master's from Princeton wow. in, in theology. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, he was very well adept and suited for the ministry here. Okay. So he ordained me as Deacon Sidak. He ordained uh, Tony as uh, Athanasius, Deacon Athanasius. And uh, Anthony Hamilton's son, Rodney, as Deacon Tesfazian. 
and he ordained Anthony Hamilton, a priest, as Cassis Amdesion. Am, oh, immediately ascended to, to priest, or was he a deacon for a little bit before then? No, no, no. He was he was ordained priest. Oh, wow. <laughs> right there. Wow. Right? After, after well, he, he spent a lot of time coming back and forth. It's not mm -hmm. like he, he, he didn't come and then do that. We met, and I subsequently spent uh, about a month in the upper upstairs uh, room in the Bronx, New York. Oh, wow. In the 70s, just studying. Yeah. The Kadassi and taking training in Amharic and Giz. And, and, the, and to just to learn the Kadassi and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so when we all were ready, he ordained us. Who and was this teaching was about you all the, the melodies there in the Bronx? Oh, boy, it was a deacon there. And you know what? You ever heard of Kes Gezahai? Yes. Yes. Malaka Gannat Gezahai Christos. He's got a Kadassi on iTunes. Yes. He's a very good singer. Yeah, he works at he works at UPS, so, and he is uh, he still living? Yeah, he's in New York. He's in Yonkers. He's in Yonkers. Uh, he's uh, a how priest old is at, he? I don't know how old he is exactly. He must but be I in his eighties or something. Oh, I don't. No, no, I don't no, think no, so. no, no. I'm in. I'm. I'm almost sixty. He was older oh, yeah? than me. Yes. Okay. He was, he okay. Was much older than me. Maybe. Maybe I'm mistaken, but I know he made some CDs. Yeah. Uh, because he's very good at what he does. Yeah, I met him in okay. Dallas a few years ago at a commemoration okay. of St. Jared. And I okay. remember I asked him to bless me in Giz, and he responded, mm. sure, in English, mm. and he blessed me. <laughs> <laughs> and it was funny because his right. English is also phenomenal. It's, it's yes. one of those, because yes. he works in corporate America, you know, his yes. his English is yes. great. Yes. So, so after I got back, you know, and after the ordination, we found a church in Compton. I don't know how familiar are you with Compton, but it was. I'm familiar. Was, I, I think it was on Alondra, way up on Alondra. Um, I'm not sure about the cross streets, but it was an old storefront right before you go across the railroad tracks. And like we were right there for probably a year, right? Um, we painted our own icons on the wall. <laughs> oh, y'all y'all bought a spot or were you renting? No, no, no. We rented. We were, it was just us. We we were very small, mm -hmm. and like like I was what, eighteen years old, right? And 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 everybody with me was the same age because we all came up together. Yeah. And so it was just Amdi's family, us, and a few other members. Oh, it wasn't that Probably. hundred that were gathered there. No, 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 for no. It wasn't the hundred that actually came, you know, because. They heard, you know, Abba Manifo was coming or Abu Yesab. It was just yeah. when we find when we first started, it was very few of us. And so we served there for a few years. And but it was a long way to travel for us. Because yeah. Amdi lived in Inglewood. Most of us lived in Gardena. And and some of us lived, you know, in Carson and you know, Carson's those areas not that right there. From Compton. It's not that far. <laughs> neither is Gardena, actually. Yeah, neither is no, it's right? not. But but for AMD, it was a long way to come from yeah. Inglewood to Compton. Right. Mm -hmm. So so we uh we got another church on Western. Western, Western and ninety second. Okay. Ninety second and Western, right? A store is that thrifty still there? Oh, I'd have to go Western there. Western and ninety second. Western and ninety second. Oh, no. Anyway, That's it was very about close to South LA College though on Imperial. Yes, it's down. It's 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 it's. I think I. I, I so it's a little north friends. of there. Ninety yes, second will be a little north of there. Yes, it is north of there. Right. So we so we 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 um we worship there for a while. The cool thing about when we worship there is that we had a, a monk. His name was Alias Abibi, who came and lived with us. For is it an Egyptian monk or an Ethiopian? No, no, no. He's an Ethiopian monk. Oh, wow. Elias uh, Elias Abibi. He later became a bishop. I think he's passed on now. Wow. But he was a phenomenal person, too. These men were just phenomenal, very smart, really good examples for us to learn from at this time in our lives. He was very stern. He was a monastic. So every day he would go up on the rooftop and pray and, you know, teach us. He was... 
he wasn't very impressed with us. You know, we were young and wild as far as he was concerned, and we weren't disciplined at all. He got mm-hmm. very frustrated very quickly with our lack of discipline. <laughs> yeah. Especially, I can imagine, if he had the sort of expectations in the way that people would be brought up in the guz and in the chanting. Yes. You know, yeah. young boys go in 7, 10, 13. So mm-hmm. 18, you'd be considered yeah. an old man. You know, I start. I started at 25. So, you know, I was yeah, yeah. even older than you when I started. Well, plus we had the language barrier. Okay, we, so this monk yeah. was not that great at English? He was not that great at English at all. He had to sit there and do sign languages half the time <laughs> and point with his cross and sometimes even hit us with the cross. You know, oh, yeah. he, was, <laughs> he was like that. Um, so um, after that, so we stayed actually at that church for quite a while. On uh, Western. Okay. Yes. And then after Western, I think we moved again to Florence. We had another church on Florence. And uh, unfortunately. Um, Flo- Florence near Inglewood or still on the east? More, yes. No, more this, was, east? this was about this was about Florence close to Crenshaw, I think. Okay. Yep. You know, that, that, that area. Oh, no, actually it was Florence and Van Ness. It was right okay. between uh, Van Ness and Crenshaw. Right between yeah. that strip. Not, not too far away. No, not too far away. Not too far away. We, we moved back and forth. We had, uh, and a lot of Ethiopians started to come and serve with us. I was going to ask at what because, point, at what point did they start coming? When the monk you know, was, like when the monk was there, was he the only Ethiopian? Well, you know, here's the thing, you know, here's the thing with Ethiopians that I have learned firsthand. And on one end, I have a lot of empathy and sympathy for them. And on the other end, it affected me greatly because many of the Ethiopians that were here when we started were exiled from the nobility. They had been uh, exiled here when the Dirk uh, took over. Mm-hmm. And they were just like stuck in America. A lot of them just escaped with, with their lives. And so we knew a lot of them. I never forget an old lady. Her name was uh, uh, Mama Jerusalem. And uh, boy, she was so nice. We used to pick her up and take her shopping and things like that. She had a daughter named Ethiopia. <laughs> and uh, a lot of who, what we assumed that they told us were relation to the emperor who had literally come here, you know, for the, to escape with their lives. So, and they weren't necessarily religious either. So even though mm-hmm. they knew Buna Yesak was here, you know, they, you know, they kind of kept their distance, right? Yeah. They came like sometimes. They were not the ones clamoring to organize together and write letters to the bishop to form a church. That was more Kasisam uh, Desion. Yeah. Well, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm Desion. We already had the church, right? Yeah. It's just that it was so early in terms of Ethiopians coming, it was so early. We were just had the church before the Ethiopians ever even started coming here in great numbers. Yeah. Okay. But as the revolution went on, you saw more and more Ethiopians start to come to the States, particularly the Los Angeles region because of refugees and, and immigration. Yeah. And so the congregation grew larger and larger. Uh, do you know, uh, uh, father Michael, he's a, he's a eunuch. No, I don't know him. He's he's, he's very tall. Ethiopian, Egyptian. Yeah. Yeah. He's a, he's an Ethiopian. He's a eunuch. Okay. I I don't know him. Okay. He, he came through and spent a lot of time with anyway, I digress. So, so, so anyway, um, we had the church from about 1980. Till I would say, you know, maybe about 10 years, maybe about between yes. eight and 10 years. That's right? when I came we were, into the picture. Eight, okay. 89 is when the Mary churches were formed and yes. uh, Abuna, uh, oh my God, Abuna Paulos brought two priests from, uh, I think one from the Midwest and one from Egypt who were both Ethiopian. And those are the priests who baptized me. I, I was born in 1990. So I, when I was born, it was in the tumult of the changing of the, the guard there. And then even the two Mary churches themselves yes. 
forming yes. and, and splitting. Like that's yes. the, the whole milieu is that. So your experience, I know a lot of the people that were the Ethiopians that were involved there. I know some folks who came in the late 60s. Um, I know some folks who came in the early 70s as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. And they were probably, right. I've heard anecdotally, they're around 100 or less in, in the early 70s. So, you know, as it yeah. gets into the 80s that you're talking about, yes. more they're coming in more and more droves fleeing the yes. the kind of uh, communist regime. I also know someone named Abba Gebrez Adik. He must have had a different name when he was a deacon, but I don't know if you remember him. He he relayed to me this history orally. My aunt has also written down some of the history in one of our yearly magazines for our church right. as the history right. of our parish Virgin Mary's, which is why right. I wanted to get you on to get your perspective as one of the African Americans who were here uh, or the black Americans that were here in, in Los Angeles. To, so I'm trying to get a more complete kind of picture of the story, but Abba Gabras Adik, he was an Episcopalian. He told me mm. prior mm. to um, meeting Abba Mandefro, who was later Abu Isaac. So right. I don't know if you knew anybody who was an Episcopalian who who came in. Um, I may. I have to, I have to call I him may. and ask him what his old name was because his okay. his new name is yeah. Abba Gabras Adik, and he's still around. Okay. He's probably he's up there in his seventies, if not eighties, okay. and he's he's in Hawaii right now. Okay, okay. Um, but but bell, you were saying but... they're starting to integrate. They're starting to have Ethiopians. Uh, you're saying yes. they may or may not have been as pious, but you know are starting to integrate with the community. Um, not with us, not oh, with us. Oh, not all. with you. Oh, okay. No, okay. no, no. Yeah, you know, I tell you why. I, I tell you why because we prayed in English. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Abuna Yisak had taught us Kadassi in English. The and whole thing, or the were there whole, some parts the you're whole still absolute English? thing. Yeah. Absolutely, the whole thing. He he said, "You guys pray in English." And mm -hmm. you can even sing your own songs after Kadassi. This yes. is, and and it, it turns out that that's how Abu Yeshak was so successful with the the West Indies and the African Americans when he came here, mm -hmm. because he did not require people to learn Giz or Amharic. He just brought to Kadassi in English and taught us, and it was up to us. But ironically, we wanted to learn the Giz. Yeah. We wanted to learn the Amharic, but there were so few Ethiopians around us that we only saw on the on Sunday, if we were lucky, that we sat with and maybe had a meal and shook hands, and that was it until the next Sunday. So we weren't really that integrated. How with big the Ethiopian would you say community. that community was at the time? Your just, church, just a handful. Oh, you mean our church? Yeah, yeah. Our church was probably I don't know, fifteen, twenty people. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. That's you know, a small community. 15, 20 people. It's yeah. spread all over. You know, we had Rastas come in, uh, you know, sometimes. And then we had African-Americans that were coming out from the uh, Protestant church and Catholic church. Uh, but, you know, part of the problem is, you know, is that we never really had a chance to grow mm -hmm. because in the early 80s, um, well, Obviously, I, you know, you, you're probably familiar with the fact that when the dirt took over, they jailed Abuna Theophilus. Yes. And they uh, installed Abuna Teklehamanat. Mm -hmm. Now, Abuna Teklehamanat, I think he goes down in history as at least being one of the holiest patriarchs. After all, he was a, he was a hermit. They just went and got him out of the cave and made him the patriarch. He's right? the only one, I don't know if you ever followed the ethnic politics. He's the only one where people are not sure what his exact ethnicity was. Now mm -hmm. they can guess he was generally a northerner, just because that's where most monks come from. Mm -hmm. But nobody knows exactly. Whereas the other patriarchs, yes. one, two, four, five, and six, everybody right. knows exactly what their hood is in Ethiopia. Yeah. And yeah. you know, there's yeah. there's really no surprises there. Yeah. He yeah, he also walked around barefoot. He yes. uh, I have a Very Bible. Holy. Yeah, I He's have a, a Bible um, somewhere around here. Uh, I have a Bible that was stamped mm -hmm. that he put together, the 81 yes. book version that we, we still use it. People are still printing it, you know. That's awesome. That's um, awesome. So, yeah, he was a great man. Slept on the floor. <laughs> yes, yes. So, and, and he refused to wear all the regalia that the, that the uh, yellow. patriarch he had. He loved the well. yellow. He, his... he wore his yellow robe yeah. all the time signifying, you know, humility. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I love that. Um, however, let me just tell you the backdrop against, you know, what what really broke the church up in mm-hmm. in uh, in the African-American community. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you probably know this as well as I do. But um, Abuna Theophilus, shortly after he was shortly before he was jailed, ordained probably five or six people as archbishops. And it was during the time when uh, uh, Abba Johannes or Abba Paulos was here in the States. See, mm-hmm. Ab- Abuna Paulos and Abuna Yesa grew up together. They were yep. friends. They were from the same village. Yeah. Okay. And went to the same theological colleges. They were both sent here. Abba Manifo was sent here to do evan- evangelist work. And Abuna Paulos was sent here to study so he can go back and do some administrative work in the church. Yeah, he wrote a dissertation so, on uh, Felicetta, on the Assumption of the Virgin, which I read mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, some eight years ago. Right. And he was also at Princeton. You mentioned uh, Abuna Yes, Isaac he went to Princeton. Princeton and Abuna Isaac. They both went to Princeton and uh, St. Vladimir's uh, Theological Seminary also. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they had some dual degrees in theology. Brilliant men, both of them. Both, I, I, if I was to point to three men that have prof- uh, uh, affected my spiritual life profoundly, it would be Abuna Paulos, Abuna Isaac, and Abuna Lua. Okay? Um, and, and I hated to see the relationship between Abuna Paulos and Abuna Yesak deteriorate the way, way it did with mm-hmm. us in the middle. And since Abuna, Yesa, Abuna Paulos was ordained by Abuna Theophilus and Abuna Theophilus was executed and Abuna Paulos was put in jail. So Abuna Paulos spent from that time in the late 70s all the way to 1983 in a prison in Ethiopia. Wow. When he got out of prison, he immediately came to the States to finish his uh, uh, degrees and just to rest from all the turmoil that was going on in Ethiopia. Mm-hmm. And as soon as he came to uh, America, you know, I, I, you know, I know people are maybe listening to this and maybe find some issues with what I'm saying, but I was on the inside, I know. That and that's why I have you here. De- like, as, Deacon as, as soon, please. <laughs> as, as soon as he came, conflict erupted between Abuna Paulos and Abuna Yesak. Mm-hmm. Naturally so, because when Abuna Yesak was Abba Manderful, the the Dirk put Abuna Theophilus in jail, later executed him, set up Abuna Teklahamana. Abuna Teklahamana then calls Abuna, uh, Ab, then Abba Manderful back to Ethiopia and ordains him, along with m- many other people, archbishops. Because the Dirk told him that they don't want any church dignitaries that were connected to the, the, the monarchy, Haile Selassie. So they either deposed them or executed them or threw them in jail. And pretty soon the church was left with nothing. What are they going to do? Mm-hmm. So they literally had to start all over with ordinations of archbishops to administer certain areas. And Abuna Yesak, then Abba Manifo, was brought back from America to Ethiopia and made archbishop by Abuna Teklahamana. I, I'm so he, glad, by the way, as an aside, that that you're getting into this because it shows the the kind of trauma produced by mm-hmm. communism. And mm-hmm. a lot of folks my age and younger, mm-hmm. they've begun flirting with the idea of communism. And it's mm-hmm. so crazy to me that we have within the living memory of our communities all this antagonism and trauma that you're describing. And, e- and even now, and please feel free, you know, as comfortable as you are. Like, I don't want you to say anything you're not comfortable with. But as comfortable as you are, my channel is to tell the truth from as many different perspectives and hear as many stories and narratives as possible. Yes. Because a lot of these frank discussions are not a part part of the culture. The culture likes kind of burying certain truths. The culture likes having everything kind of secret and hush hush. And I think that we have a lot of wounds from not having these sorts of discussions. And so I, I invite you as a insider outsider, because mm-hmm. you're mm-hmm. clearly a member of the church, you know, from sure. the jump and, and still running the race, you know, it's one holy universal church. So you're still right. running the race and we'll get to that part towards the end of our conversation. 
but mm -hmm. this is a, a very key part of the history. So uh, please. Well, you, you know. mentioned, you know, you mentioned something about young people flirting with the ideal of communism. Um, that story has already been told. It's um, the, 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 the young people in Ethiopia mm -hmm. were a catalyst behind overthrowing Haile Selassie. And yep. they thought that they would doing people out in the country uh, a favor because people were starving and it was still a very feudal system where, you know, the church and the nobility had all the land and everybody else is poor. So it's time for a revolution led in part by the young students who went hand in hand with the Derg and the Russian government overthrew them. But you know what happened? The students realized that the communists are just as heavy handed and authoritarian as the monarchy was. So they started to protest against the against the uh, the Derg. The Derg wasn't having it. Have you ever heard of the uh, the, the Red Terror? Of course. I should OK, be. absolutely. Yeah. That affected young students. That affected young students. They used, walk, they used to tie red bandanas around their guns and around their heads and just indiscriminately kill anybody who disagreed with what the communist government was saying. So we always say it was a coup and it was a counter coup. And many people lost their lives. A very tragic experience and time in Ethiopia. We didn't get a lot of news. All we got was what we heard through Walter Conkrack or whatever his name was, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? And, yeah. and so, and, and we used to ask, you know, Abuna Yesak to keep us updated on it and some Ethiopians, we got news sporadically, uh, but we knew what was going on. It was, it was yeah. terrible. And so, you know, Abuna Yesak, and like I said, Abuna Yesak was always associated with the Dirk unwittingly or wittingly. But obviously, if you know Abuna Yesak like I know him, that wasn't true. He was, he was an evangelist. Mm -hmm. He was on his mission. To become archbishop was his dream because now he can go back and by his hand, start churches, which I was a part of that. So I never thought of him as being part of the communist government, right? Even though the optics sure looked like it, but it wasn't in my mind to actually assume that. I love the man and still do to this day. Um, he did a lot for me, he taught me a lot. He married me, my, my wife and I, um, and he taught me a lot, right? But he never could escape that stigma of being part of that part of history mm -hmm. that ushered in um, a lot of oppression and pain in Ethiopia, even to the point where once he was ordained bishop and uh, uh, the Coptic Church and the World Council of Churches refused to recognize him as the bishop. Wow. Because in, in Ethiopia was the Ethiopian Orthodox Church for a long time was kind of a pariah because of what they did, because mm -hmm. of what because of what they allowed Mangustu to do to the hierarchy of the church, mm -hmm. okay? And so the church stayed in that condition till 91. Um, but what, what happened was, you know, Abuna Paulos continued to insist, he wasn't that, you know, Abuna Yesak wasn't the rightful archbishop because of the way he was ordained. Mm -hmm. Right, and I love both these guys. I spent time with them. I they they both taught me when they were, you know, friends. W was Abuna Paulos teaching you when you were going to New York, or was he was he in LA at no. the same time as you? No, Abuna Paulos was traveling many places. He had congregations. He made a few visits to to Los Angeles, and we got a chance to meet. Uh, I didn't really kindle up my relationship with Abuna Paulos until the mid uh, 2000s. Oh, wow, much later, yeah, when yeah, he was a yeah, patriarch. Well, when he became a patriarch, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but, um, oh my gosh, you know, it just pains me to just talk about this stuff. So Abuna Yesak, you know, we're very close. And in the, in the, early, eight, in the early 90s, when, uh, after the revolution, again, 
The second one. One revolution. Yeah. Now a second revolution comes. And yeah. it's ironic that both these revolutions affected the church in a profound way. Yeah. Okay. And so during the 80s, when all the Talmud was going on between Abuna Yesak and Abuna Paulos and the government, what can I say? I just got so exasperated with the whole thing. Mm -hmm. I just took refuge in the Coptic church. I said, you oh, know okay. what? I'm going to the Coptic church. I'm done with this because- Was that beginning of the 80s or mid 80s or towards this the was, end of the this 80s? Was, this was mid 80s. This was probably 86, 87, 88, right? This was after Abuna Paulos came back and there was a groundswell of individuals, particularly Ethiopians that have come to America who were criticizing the government in Ethiopia mm -hmm. for what they were doing to their own people. Yes. By establishing communist Marxist Leninist philosophies in the country and yeah. putting pressure on the church to do whatever they tell them to do. And there was a lot of dissidents and outspoken Ethiopians here that quite frankly, I really didn't want to have anything to do with because mm -hmm. my thing was the church. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and I think the average African American cannot wrap his head around the ideal of, uh, ethnic division in Africa, because, you know, we only have one enemy here and that's white folks who hate <laughs> us, you know? So, so it's like, so it's, if you want to call us a monolithic people in that regard, then we pretty are, we, mm -hmm. I mean, we pretty much are, right? Because like, like, you know, except when you go down to the lower levels in the hood, you got the Crips and the Bloods and the Pyrus and all these gang, right? That's kind of the only, that, that's kind of our version of ethnic fighting. A local, <laughs> very, very <Yeah>. localized. <laughs> right, right. But on a national level, you know, we, we all pretty much know that, you know, we're fighting against racism and injustice. Mm -hmm. And and you don't have to be an Omhara. You don't have to be Amhara or Tigrinian. You just have to be black in America to be oppressed, okay? You could be on your way to the grocery store to get fruits and vegetables and pass a white woman and she clenches her purse, mm -hmm. right? And that's, that's what we have dealt with in America. And so it's difficult for the average African-American to wrap their head around um, the uh, identity politics, you know, ethnic politics. Uh, I, I, I learned it just from being around and studying Ethiopia for so many years, that it's real. And it, it was back then and it continues today. And I was engulfed in it because I loved the church so much and I wanted to be a part of it. And every time I went back and tried to start again, it would rear its ugly head. It would even ultimately end up affecting me. Um, so after I was serving in the, in the Coptic church for a while, when I was in my, uh, early thirties in 1994, I moved to St. Louis because I got a great job offering. So when I came here, no church, mm -hmm. right? So, but I did, so I was in the Coptic church and periodically Ethiopians used to come just to pray because they didn't have a church, right? Yeah. So I approached one of them, I said, so you guys don't have a church? Let's start a church, right? So it just so happens that there was a priest here who was a taxi driver. His name was um, Cassis Astorai. Yeah. Uh, you know him? I don't know him personally. We got Abba Thomas Finley. Do you know Abba Thomas Finley? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Abba, Abba Thomas, I have, sure. He's our father. Him. He's also a disciple of Abu Isaac. He's been at Dingil Mariam at Virgin Mary's for yeah. some, I think, 10, 15 years. The church he was with before this was with Cassis Astaraya in St. Louis. We are, all three of us were together. Mm -hmm. All three of us started together. And, yeah, Abba uh, Thomas is still with us. Yes, I know. I'm friends with him on Facebook. We often uh, communicate. Um, so, so, Cassis Astaraya had bore the scars of the revolution and was very much uh, um, a rebel. I loved him for it, <laughs> right? I just, I just loved his fiery attitude and the things he stood for. Um, but 
um, you know, in my ignorance, right? I would say unintentionally, I was, I went, Abuna Paulos invited me to come and visit him when he came to America in, I believe it was 2005. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I says, okay, I went to visit him. And I think after that moment, my relationship with Cassis was not the same anymore. Right. Because by that time, you had the church in exile. Yes. Being led by Abuna Theophilus, who was exiled after the people's the people's Abuna revolutionary. Theophilus? I'm sorry, Abuna Abuna Marcos. Yes. Sorry, Abuna is it, Marcos. Is it, was it Abuna Zina Marcos? Abuna Zina Marcos. Right. Yeah. He was a he he was a patriarch that was enthroned after the death of Abuna Teklahamanan. Okay. But at the same, but probably around the same time. Oh, the Abuna Mercorios. Abuna Mercorios. Abuna Mercorios. Okay, yeah. yes. Abuna Mercorios was the fourth patriarch, and a couple archbishops, one of which Abuna Zena Marcos was, uh, I think is an interesting position called like next in line. It's like the person who's next in line to be enthroned. Right. Abuna Zena Marcos and Abuna Melkes Eric came, and Abuna Elias, I think a little later, although he ended up in Europe, they ended up leaving around that time. Well, Abuna Marcos, the patriarch, yes, sent himself into self-exile after the People's Revolutionary Democratic Front took over. In 91. From the yeah. He came to America. And it took a while for the Ethiopians to coalesce around him, but eventually they built a legitimate church in exile here in America. Yeah, I, I, which I was a part of when I was ordained. It was as a part of the synod in exile. Okay. Prior to so, the reconciliation that happened just two years ago. Right. So me, I mean, I wasn't really with the church in exile. You know, mm -hmm. I was really like always stuck on the mother church because mm -hmm. of my lack of knowledge about what was actually going on. Yeah. The revolution, it makes sense. another revolution. I mean, my mind really wasn't on taking ethnic sides. I was just connected to the mother church because that's where I wanted to be. Yeah. In Ethiopia, in, it was undivided. In, it's yes. in the diaspora where you had three groups. You had yes. the church in exile, the church in Ethiopia, and mm -hmm. the so-called independent churches, many of the independent parishes, which were the legacy of Abu Nisak. Yeah. So, so I found myself gravitating more towards Abuna Paulos mm -hmm. than Abuna Yesak because of mm -hmm. certain situations that happen where Abuna Paulos and his authoritarian figureheads, I guess, physically uh, sorry, had... Sorry, sorry, Deacon Sirak, you, you cut out a so, little bit. Can you say oh, that I'm sorry. Again? Yeah. So, so in the early 90s, Abuna Paulos actually had Abuna Yesak removed from his church physically. Wow. Physically with guns drawn, the American authorities came in there and escorted Abuna Yesak and all the clergy out of Holy Trinity Church in Brooklyn. And took and and the church in Ethiopia took possession of it. Effectively ending Abuna Yesak's uh, bishopry. But not so. So he was. Uh, so he had a lot to do with forming the church in exile, also, right? So here I am in the middle of all this. And like I said again, I just want to serve. You know, uh, you know, God has enlightened me. I'm I'm really not with all the politics in the church because, quite frankly, I didn't know a whole lot of what was going on uh, very deeply to take sides. I I was just interested in the orthodox way of life yes so again and you, and you are living this at the parish that Cassius Astaraya formed yeah yeah we had started a church here called saint mary's mm -hmm. and when i went to visit the patriarch it came back everything fell apart they didn't they didn't they seem like they didn't have anything to do with me anymore you know and i've had conversations with Cassius about how you know displeased he was that I did that and some of the people 
around were displeased with me. Then I came back, I'm like, hey, I went to visit the Patriarch. It was so great. Look what mm -hmm. he told me. And everybody was like, what? You did yeah. what? <laughs> right? It's like, I'm like, oops. <laughs> yeah. So I just decided, you know what? I'm going to the Coptic church. I'm fine right there. Right. And that really kind of underscores or really marks my history in the church, this constant you know, um, pull, uh, push and pull. I want to go back to the church, but these obstacles are in my way. And, but I tell you what, Hinak, the most happy that I've ever felt was, what, six months ago when when the church unified? It was a couple of oh, years said, ago. Yeah. yeah a couple, okay. I mean, look, look at me. I don't know where my it's okay. track of time is. But I thought to myself, I want to come back. It's like, yeah. I'm back, right? Where do I go, right? <laughs> and so I'm really entrenched in the Coptic church here. I, I serve, you know, I teach and things like that. Um, but when I went, so the church here in St. Louis finally got their own priest. And right now they have a congregation of probably over 200 people. You're saying the Ethiopian parish? The Ethiopian parish here, St. Mary's Church here is huge. Mm -hmm. Lots of Ethiopians in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. right? Um, I've been there a few times and said hi to a lot of the people that know me from, from a while back. Uh, Cassis, I think he's moved on. He, I think he went to Kansas City. And, and I think he got into some issues, some theological issues with some Ethiopian uh, things and you know anyway i lost contact with him also those those are some issues the whole church needs to resolve i would encourage yeah. people to go and find abuna paulos's uh dissertation because there's something funny that happened because he committed a certain teaching to the word and the issue is people's understanding of the immaculate conception yes and uh there there's some issues about some folks uh confusing the catholic position with the orthodox yes, no. position yes no we don't believe in the catholics position of the immaculate uh, conception we we do not believe that yeah ours is however different. when that when that is expressed in amharic people get hyper defensive i and, get it you know because yeah. they they think that there is uh, a boogeyman protestant move or or something to take away and steal the praise of the virgin mary somehow yeah understood i i i like to stay away from those subjects unless i'm mm -hmm. talking in a theological circles because yeah. i realize the average lay person as just they unless you studied it you really don't understand the history of it um but hey by the same token saint mary is a uh very large figure in our church and rightly so and i always tell people in order to understand why we venerate and respect the Virgin so well, you must first understand the divinity of Christ. Because mm -hmm. when you understand the divinity of Christ, then you understand the importance of St. Mary in our worship. And that's all there's to it. It's like, understand that first, how the Son of Man existed in secret with his Father before the world was created. And this woman held this entity, this divine substance, God Almighty, in her womb for nine months. No, enough said. <laughs> right? If you need any more, then you're not really thinking through this. You know, that's why I tell Protestants all the time. You know, they, they just can't wrap their mind around it because of what the Catholics have done to the teachings. See, see a lot of protestism evolves around Catholicisms that they disagree with. So you got schisms and isms. I'm orthodox. I don't deal with either one of them. And that's what I'm trying to relay to, you know, many African Americans that, you know, we need to in mass come out of the Protestant churches because this was what's given to us when we were in slavery. And so now we're free. And now we have our opportunity to go back to our roots and understand uh, ancient apostolic Christianity the way it was meant to be. And as it was it's an uphill, in Africa. Yes, but it's an uphill bat battle because of the language barrier. Yeah, you, you need know, that flexibility remember. of Abuna Isaac's model that contours yes, to the exactly. culture of the Black American. 
Exactly. And there's so and it's been difficult to rely on the Ethiopians to get that because they have been in so much turmoil for the last 40 years that it's just impossible. Yeah. And we're just getting you know, back on our feet now. Do, do, yes. do they have African Americans at your Coptic parish now? And is your parish more Coptic and Arabic or is it more of an English speaking American mission? For as long as I can remember, I have been the only African American in any Orthodox church that I've visited. Now, I'll tell you who's making headway in the African American community is the uh, Antiochian Orthodox Church, who has now branded themselves as the what North American Orthodox Church or something like that. And they pray in all English all the time using the Russian rite. But it doesn't compare to what Abuna Yesak has established. You know, Abuna Yesak had established a pretty large parish of African-Americans in New Jersey. Uh, and St. Michael's in Tunic, New Jersey is all African-Americans. Matter of fact, mm -hmm. they have the first uh, African-American monk that was tonsured, you know, several years ago. And of course, the church is big in Jamaica, in Trinidad, in Tobago, St. Kitts, St. The, the Virgin Islands. Um, you know, his work is, his legacy is still there. Yes, I, I just spoke with uh, his Beatitude Abuna Thaddeus or Thaddeus mm. recently, and mm. he mm. told me he's been there for some forty-eight years. Sure. So they've yeah. they've they've been there for quite a while. Absolutely, absolutely. So so anyway, just to just to wrap it up, um, after my visit with Abuna Paulos, mm -hmm. I you know just decided that you know I would just coalesce around the Coptic church until I have an opportunity. Right. <laughs> and, um, I like that. And, 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 and I never forget, I went to the, to the Ethiopian church here after the reunification mm -hmm. and I actually wanted to serve and start my service. And I didn't know any of the priests. Mm -hmm. I didn't know any of, I knew the people. Some of the older people came up to me. They greeted me. How you doing? You know, can you stay? You know, we need you here. And like, I was feeling pretty good about it. But my relationship with, with the priest there was next to nothing because they were all new. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't know. Right. And, you know, I think they asked me if I wanted to serve. And I said, well, you know, sure. And they said, well, we got to clear it with the board. And I thought, yeah, no, that's not the way we <laughs> I mean, that may be the way the Ethiopian church does things, but <laughs> I'm not used to that, right? If you want to serve, you go clear with the archbishop, you know, and the priest. You take your confession, you start your spiritual life, and you start serving. Alexander Schmemann, who was one of the leaders at St. Vladimir's, which you mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. one of the great Orthodox theologians of the 20th century, he has mm -hmm. this paper where he, he wrote out what happened in Russia and in mm -hmm. Greece, mm -hmm. and and their whole mission in the United States. And the mm -hmm. very same thing happened in the United States with Ethiopian communities, but because of one individual in Canada, it didn't. And now it's on its way changing. What really? happened was when the Russians and the Greeks originally had things, they're coming from monarchies. And in the monarchy, mm -hmm. an aristocrat would just grant a plot of land to mm -hmm. the church the churches would build, the priests would be in charge, and they would build communities and cities around it. The same thing happened in Ethiopia traditionally. When we came to the United States, it was more grassroots and bottom up than top down than the way it was in the home country. So that the parishioners who built the, the churches here felt that they had more stake and ownership. So they began introducing democratic principles, which of course, uh, for people, this is an impolite truth, but democracy is the God of Barabbas, not the God of Jesus. Through democracy, <laughs> Barabbas is chosen, not Jesus. Jesus is That's crucified right. through democracy. Right. And so right. hierarchy is actually antithetical to democracy. And that's mm -hmm. one of the things that's intention. So the parishes in the United States started bottom up and they emulated the Protestant systems. And so the, the systems of governance with the boards here in the United States resemble that. In Canada, there was Good one point. individual, as he's named, uh, Lika Kahanat Misali, mm. who, uh, I don't know if you know the singer The Weeknd, but The Weeknd donated 50,000 to their church. It's St. Mary's in Toronto. He began there and he made sure all of the churches in Canada that mm. their bylaws 
had a hierarchy as the rule, meaning rule by priests. And right. the right. synod during the reconciliation, one of the many statements they made is mm -hmm. that they're going to be enforcing that system going forward in the reu reunited church. So mm -hmm. it, it hasn't fully come to fruition yet, right. but the United Synod has announced that every church is going to be restructuring so that there, there could be something called a board in the various parishes, but it would be underneath the authority of the priests. And that's and the, something and the, that is slowly happening. Well, well, I know in the Coptic church, the board and the clergy have two very different roles. You know, the board is usually pays the bills, make sure the housekeeping is done, um, just make sure the, the the ancillary services of the church are are done, while the the priests and the clergy do all the spiritual work. You know, and you know that's kind of how how at least the cops run things in America. So, so that's uh, ideal. And the issue is during that tumultuous period you mentioned, mm -hmm. I know of at least three examples, including the patriarch and a couple archbishops of bishops who were fired by their boards and literally yes. made homeless, you know, within yes. 24 hours notice. Yes. That happens in the Coptic church also. Oh, and wow. It's usually, and it's usually, you know, because of one or two very well-placed, powerful people who give a lot of money. Yeah. In, in Ethiopia, okay. that would never happen. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I wouldn't think so. I don't think e even in Egypt, it wouldn't happen only in America. Um, but you know what my dream is? I tell you what my dream is. <laughs> tell me. And I'm going to, I'm going to put this out to your channel. So if you Please. have anybody, um, my, my great, great grandfather, uh, his father was a slave. Uh, his name is Frank Cole. He was able to amass about a 200 acres of land in uh, Tyler, Texas. And it has subsequently about a hundred of it has passed to me directly. Wow. And I would love to give some of that land to the church for a monastery. I don't know, do they have any Ethiopian monasteries in the States? So there, so here's part of the tumult during the tumult there were talks and some money gathered about building something around Dallas, which Tyler's just outside, right? Yep, of, uh, yep, Dallas. About 45 minutes. That never coalesced. There is a plot of land, to my knowledge, in upstate New York, which has been designated and sanct like consecrated. I don't know what the technical term is, but it's been designed, but I think it just has not been built. There's a Viber group of which I was a part of for a long time that are trying to build a monastery in Virginia. There is a monastery built in Kentucky, and I've heard some people in Seattle talk about building one. So mm. the only one that I know for sure exists is in Kentucky right now. And okay. um, a lot of people go there for the holy water for the Sabbath yes. ceremony. Yes, I it's got some, uh, I got a video of that. Yeah, yeah that's in Kentucky. Video. It's a, a Gabriel. It's dedicated to the archangel yes. Gabriel. Yes. I saw a report and, on that. Yeah, and I don't know the status of the Virginia one, but from when I was in part of the Viber group, they used to also mention that they also want to turn it into, you know, one of the big things we miss in North America is the Abenet, the traditional mm -hmm. schools of, mm -hmm. of learning of the good is poetry mm -hmm. and the various mm -hmm. Eucharistic and non-Eucharistic liturgical schools. So they also right, wanted, right. wanted to do that as as well in the Virginia one. And then okay. as far as the plot of land, I think they're I think they're moving forward. They're moving forward slowly, but I think they're they are moving forward in upstate New York as well. Okay. Well, don't build a monastery in New York. It's too cold. <laughs> Go someplace Texas that at least better. has weather like Ethiopia, you know? Yeah. It's got to <laughs> anyway. look like a desert too. <laughs> anyway, just thought I'd throw the offer out there. If anybody oh, knows. please. Yeah. If, if we have because, any uh, affluent folks or, or, or clergy. Because when I get um, ready to retire, man, I would love for a monastery to be like right, right across the street. <laughs> yeah, that would be great. And I've, I've got to ask, you know, um, and maybe it's too personal a question for this channel. So feel free not to answer. But uh, I'm sure you've done the anaphora of Our Lady Mary before. And I don't know if you know, there's this funny part in the anaphora of Mary and the good is right, where they say, make this deacon into a priest. So, <laughs> <laughs> when do we get Abu Nasirak? I, I don't know, right? That's, that's, that's up to God, right? And it, it would be, you know, you know, right now it's more likely that that would happen in the Coptic church than the Ethiopian church. Mm -hmm. However, I think I would do more 
good in the Ethiopian church uh, just because of black people, uh, particularly Americans. Uh, so I, I can't say it's on my radar, uh, but you know, God knows I'll just keep serving and, and be available to do as he leads me. But you know, it's definitely not in my plans. <laughs> Yeah, I'll tell you, I'll tell you on a personal note, I know a lot of black folks, black American folks in mm -hmm. both the Coptic church and the Ethiopian church here in Los mm -hmm. Angeles. And in fact, yeah. a lot of them had a thread going recently on Facebook about mm -hmm. a desire to have the kind of uh, respect and contouring to the black American culture within orthodoxy, obviously within yes. the black Catholic tradition. I had mm -hmm. a, a friend of mine who recently converted to that tradition and mm -hmm. he, he talked about that experience on this channel, but there, there are some folks who are definitely yearning for, for something like what you all had in that, in that golden era, maybe from the seventies to the, to the eighties. Well, 80s. that's not far away. The, the model for this is in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. St. Michael's in Tunic, New Jersey. And St. Uh, Gabriel's as well. And, and, and St. Gabriel's. So absolutely, you know. Um, you know, once this pandemic is over and people can travel freely, um, I might start taking some trips. You know where I really want to go is Trinidad, Tobago. I want to I wanna visit the church there. Same. Uh, I really would love to see what they got going on because I know that's, pretty much all West Indians there. And I think the, 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 the Caribbean diocese is there. I think the bishop's there, a bishop. I forget his name, is it Zachariah? Abuna Tadeus. That, that, was the one, that was the one I was in touch with uh, recently. Okay. I, yeah, okay. I, would, I would like to have an interview with him too. His English is good too. Yes, yes, they're all very good. Yeah, yeah. yeah you know, another interesting thing about the, the church in the 80s is uh, Bob Marley came to visit us. And um, uh, Abuna Yesag uh, baptized Bob Marley shortly before he passed away. And uh, he invited us to, he came to uh, California to do a concert at UCLA mm -hmm. and stopped by the church. And we all took pictures with him. We got free tickets to the concert. It was it was kind of it was kind of wild, you know. <laughs> uh, but but there but there was a, you know we when we started we had a lot of trouble um, um, just articulating to people that this is the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, not Rastafarianism. Mm -hmm. This was always an uphill battle. And we could have used the presence of a lot of Ethiopians to reinforce that. You know, I think so many times, you know, you know, uh, the Rastas come and they don't want to acknowledge that this is the church for Jesus Christ, but they want to they want to express their Rastafarianism through the church. And that just that just frustrated the Buni Asak a lot for years. Um, uh, but, you know, with the presence of Ethiopians, that kind of goes away. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. No. So what's interesting is people mostly assume that everyone who's a convert and we have, you know, several converts in the L.A. community and others come from that tradition. So there are some mm -hmm. who do not want to leave that behind. And there right. are some who say, you know, this is what I was. But the ultimate sort of veneration of his imperial majesty is to actually convert to the religion of his imperial majesty, which is Orthodox Christianity. Correct. Correct. And so we have a number of people who've actually had full conversions and from various, the Rastas themselves have multiple sects within them. 12 mm -hmm. tribes, Bobo Shanti. There, there's mm -hmm. so many, I don't even know all the various groups, but right. I know there are various groups and subgroups even within Rastafarianism that, right. you know, some who hold them as deity, some, you know, who just maybe want to canonize them as saint. And so hold another discussion for another day. But what's right. fascinating I think are the black Americans who do not come from the Rastafarianism. It, I'm one of you them. You know, you mentioned the Crips. Yeah, you mentioned the Crips. And I guess you could say that's one worldview or POV. But is there any sort of, a, right now, people would refer to it as the conscious community. Maybe in the earlier days, people would refer to it as a Pan-Africanism or, or Garveyism. Is there a general philosophy or worldview that you think would have uh, maybe prepared you to want to be interested because 
for the American, the Ethiopian church is, is a pretty obscure church, even, even today, you know, after decades of being here. <clears throat> I would say that in the, in the early church, in the, in the day of Pentecost, when those people were gathered together in the upper room, and the Holy Spirit came like a rush of a mighty wind. And it filled those who were inside. Okay. So now you know those who were inside had a very authentic uh, revelation mm -hmm. of Christ. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. So whatever they were before that, they were now changed. Okay. And they, and they could have been Greek. They could have been Ethiopian. They could have been Egyptian. They could have been Arabian. But now they have this grace about them, and they are citizens of the kingdom. Okay? Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is within. Well, this is the event in which it was planted within. And this is the kind of experience I had. Okay? It, it wasn't anything to prepare me for that other than maybe... I don't know, maybe my ancestors interceding for me, you know, maybe my mother laying up at night crying that God would save me because any day I would end up either dead or in jail, you know, with, with the way I was going, you know, I was just lost. Right. And then when the church started to grow, right, you see the church is like really big right now. Well, there are various people who come to the church just because they like to join things. Mm -hmm. Okay, they are various people who come to the church because they think they can profit from it. They're not enlightened. <laughs> They're not enlightened at all. They don't. They don't have an enlightened bone in their body. They're just there because maybe their mother made them come, or their father made them come, or maybe they grew up in the church and they don't know anything better. But that enlightenment, okay, that experience from Pentecost is really not there, at least yet. Okay, and this is, you know, the church from the time of its ancient roots until now, it's billion people, right? And Jesus said, the way is narrow and few there are that be will get in, right? He said in another, he said in another space, they said, Lord, didn't we visit the sick? Didn't we heal? Didn't we visit the prisoners? Did we heal the sick? He's, he's going to say to them, and I'm paraphrasing, he's going to say to them, get away from me. I never knew you. Right? So, so, you know, everybody that's a Christian, no matter what background they come from or what prepared them to come into the church, the root of the church are those that have that authentic experience with God personally, okay? Whether you're a Baptist or Methodist or a Presbyterian or, or an Orthodox or a Catholic, okay? There are those in all of these different denominations that have real authentic experiences with the Holy Spirit, and that's why they're Christian, okay? But then there are those that, like I said, from the other class. So I don't know if, if I follow um, that line of, of, of reasoning, something that prepared me to come. Mm -hmm. I never, I never planned to come. It just happened. You know, it's just something that is the reason why I'm here today because it happened. Otherwise, I don't know where I'd be. I'd probably be a statistic. You know, that's real. I, I was just going to ask you in, in closing, if you either had any parting advice, although I think you kind of answered it, if you have any parting advice or not just how you got here, so how did you stay? Because you're a person who through many ups and downs that you've detailed for us, you've, you've stayed, you found some way to stay involved, you know, whether it be with the cops or whether it be with us good as folks of many stripes, you found some way to keep running the race. What, what is it that has, that has helped you, you know, with this continuity and, you know, what advice would you, would you give for maybe young Ethiopian Christians who are running into stumbling blocks or local politics or ethnic mm. politics or what, whatever it may be mm. that may be their particular mm. stumbling block? Mm. Good question. So I think what makes me stay because it's fluid, you know, it's, it's every day 
what what makes me stay is I don't have anywhere else to go. Right? It was, it was, it was, what do you want me to do? Turn back? Right? You know, I, I, I it's, it's kind of like this. Um, if you if you get on the uh, ten freeway, and uh, no, let's say the four hundred five. You're getting on the four hundred five. You're headed to San Fernando Valley. Okay, you know you're going. You, you know you're going that way. You may have a flat tire. You may get slowed with traffic, but you're still going that way. You have mm -hmm. all kind of obstacles in your way, and you're going that way. Okay, but the thing you better not do is turn around, and start going to San Diego. Yeah. Because if you go to San Diego, you're lost. Okay. So my message is stay on the road to San Fernando Valley. Because <laughs> if you, you may have a flat tire, you may have, uh, uh, you may even get stopped by the police and get a ticket. Okay. You may run into traffic. Things may frustrate you on the road. Don't turn back. Because if you turn back, you are lost. That you have no hope if you turn back. Right? So whenever I get frustrated or whenever things I feel down and I feel like giving up, I just know it, this is just a bump in the road. God wants me to stay where I am. God wants me to keep pushing forward. Okay. And for me, that is keep up my cadassi, keep up my prayers, watch and pray. Especially now, a lot of people getting carried away. I have never seen people so crazy in the world as I've seen them today. Okay, you got folks right now. Listen, we just had a hurricane in certain parts of our country. Mm -hmm. I've seen folks intentionally go out in the hurricane just to see what it would be like. And they remind me of the same type of people that go around others now with no mask, no social distancing, and no washing their hands. They don't even believe in this stuff. These are the same type of individual with the same type of thinking. That if you're looking, sometimes you don't really have to look for a revelation. Okay? God's just telling you, hey, the doctor just told you what to do. I sent the doctor. But don't pray that God answer your prayer. I'm sending you the advice right now, this is what you need to do. Stay in the house. Board up your house. Don't go out. If you if you can't, uh, um, if you can leave, a hurricane is coming. And then come back later. Okay? He's telling us, if you don't want to catch the virus, do these three things. Social distance, wear a mask, wash your hands. There was just a story out the other day right here in St. Louis where teachers were so gung ho to go back to school. They all went back to school. OK, they said, let's go out to lunch. They all piled in the same car and went out to lunch. All of them caught COVID. Lord have mercy. And it's just OK. What do you say about that? They're like, well, OK, I'm moving on. Right. I'm, I, you know, I don't like wearing mask. OK, but I do it for you. I, and you do it for me. And and I think that kind of attitude is becoming uh, so scarce in America today. We we take liberty. That old American word, we take liberty not to care about each other. And that's not the way we're going to survive. It, it, liberty was never meant to be used like that, to be selfish, to be mean. Right. So, you know, stay on the road. Don't turn back. God has given you already a gift. He's given you the church. OK, he's given you a culture that um, introduces you to the Christian faith and the Christian way of life. Take advantage of it. Right. Don't be clouded by politics, ethnic politics, uh, uh, conservative and, and liberal politics. You know, this is about your eternal life. You know, take your take your opportunity to vote. Right. That's that's a good thing. You know, you can have your opinion about things. But the most important thing is eternal life for me, for me. Right. This is where 
This is where my life is centered around. That I know I was put here for a reason. And that reason is purely to serve God and worship him and try to do his will in my life. Because I've watched many people pass away. And I know my day is coming. And I want to be ready. You know, a lot of uh-huh. people, you know, a lot of young people, especially, they don't think like that. So, look, I'm in my 30s. I ain't thinking about death right now. But I've always thought that way. You know, I, the, the, the great possibility to enter into life after this life is compelling. And I think the Holy Spirit that lives within us keeps us inspired to keep on striving for that, right? That's how it works. So, you know, and God will give you a revelation for free. You just have to ask. You just have to continue to ask. If you don't think you are at a place where you want to be in your spiritual life, pray, ask God in a very sincere way. And he'll give you his revelation. He'll give you all the tools you need to continue on this journey. You know, don't turn around and head towards San Diego because then you're lost. Thank you. you. You couldn't have told me a better parable. I grew up in Van Nuys in the heart of uh, the San Fernando Valley, right off the 405. So there you go. I hope, I hope everybody else has ears to hear. I, I certainly do. And I'm the Saganalo Xavier. Thank you so much. Shukran in Arabic. Thank Shukran. you. Thank you so much for your time. Deacon Sirak, a.k.a. Deacon Scott, a.k.a. Deacon Beshoy. <laughs> okay, Yanak. Appreciate the time. Thank you. You too. Have a blessed one. Salam.